the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Christ. You know, I think I have a few verses to be around. You have to ask me to your father more than I have other things to say. But I'm using a lot of baby when it comes to watching a movie. Except, I usually don't like to watch a movie twice. Especially if it's a thriller. Because I already know the ending. But I realized this past week everyone was asleep early one night. And I realized I'm getting old. Because I watched a thriller that I thought I had never seen it before. And after two hours, I realized the whole plot unraveled that I've already seen this at least a year ago. It's sad to realize that. But these kind of movies are wonderful. These thrillers, where you have no idea what's going to happen. The good guy ends up being the bad guy. The person you thought was the most important all of a sudden fades away. And this is what we have in today's gospel. It's really a thriller. Because the one that we think is doing the right thing is actually not. There's a very scary thing about being orthodox. And it's thinking that we're always right. It's good to be right. I'd rather be right than wrong. But if we're right without love, we've accomplished nothing. A couple days ago, the epistle, that was the daily epistle reading, was very powerful. You know, St. John, the beloved disciple, the one that lay on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. So beautiful. He is the one that really teaches us about love in this epistle because that was what was so important to him. Imagine the first century Christians, how tempting it would have been just to offer sacrifice to an idol so you don't have your head to cut off. Imagine how difficult it must have been when their whole earth was shaken and it would have been very tempting to hate each other. But he urges them to love one another. This is what he says in his first universal epistle. Brethren, I am writing you no new command, but an old command, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet I am writing to you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away. And the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness too. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and in it there is no cause for stumbling. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this message still rings true that St. John wrote to those trembling Christians almost 2,000 years ago. It is easy for us to say we're good Christians. It's easy for us to say we are faithful or the God. And we're getting ready to embark on great men where we have all these boxes to check. Did I pass? Did I go to the service? Did I lie? Did I give some food to the hunger? If we check those boxes without seeing that the person in front of us is our brother, then we sadly miss the point. You know, when? I'm going to show you. That's why I brought the gospel now. This is what I read this morning. This page and this page. If you stop right here, that's where everything ends up good. It looks like it's supposed to end there. There's a nice paragraph in it. It fits right on the page. 
But it is when you turn the page that the older brother is introduced into the story. And the gospel does this for a reason. Because the ending is always open. As long as there is a breath in our lungs, the ending is always open. If I'm doing great, I can sin miserably. And if I'm sinning miserably, just like the thief on the cross, who when he was breathing his last breath, said, Remember me, O Lord, in your kingdom. And Christ turned and said, Today you will be in paradise. This is what he wants to say to all of us. This is what the Father wanted to say to both of his sons. Today come and be with me in paradise. Those that were lost have been returned to the table. Let's kill the bad guys. Let's bear and make merry. For your brother was lost and is found. So when the older son begins discussing things with his father, it's not his brother. It's your son. It's your son. He had no relationship with his brother. And if you have no relationship with the brother, how can you have a relationship with the father? You know, there's many wonderful things on HBO, on TV, on YouTube, that give an idea of what this story might be like if real actors were involved. And they're beautiful. But they kind of trick you. Because the only thing you know from the gospel is that it said he lived riotous living. That's all you know. It says nothing about prostitution. It says nothing about drug use. It says riotous living. For some people, they serve loud music. Might be riotous living. But what does the younger, what does the older brother say? He wasted your money with parties. He just assumes. There's so many times we want to attack someone else, my brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't even have evidence. We just assume. Because the more that we can make someone else look bad, the better we are. But when we stand before that merciful Father, there's nothing to stand. The guy that sinned for you. Everybody here this morning. You're here this morning because you know we're not worthy. But God wants to perfect you in this way. The story as I mentioned it is still open. Even after we read this episode, the story is still open. The Father hasn't kicked anyone out of his house. He's welcomed the one that went away and the one that saved. <coughs> who hasn't been a loving relationship, he offered to come to the table, to open this door. So wherever we are in our walk, wherever we are in our life, the door is open. The door is open, but repentance must be a part of it, realizing we're not perfect, but that God wants to protect us, but His way not the ways of the world. You know, there's a very tragic song. I think it's Psalm 137, if I'm not mistaken. It speaks about the Jews being in Babylon when they were cast out. God himself cast them out. Allowed the Babylonians to destroy them. And they sing some really sad songs. In fact, they don't sing songs. Listen to what they say. By the waters of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue sing to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem, my highest joy. Why do I bring Psalm 137? The Jews have been taken into captivity, and the Babylonians are coming 
sin that dissolved of your native land. And they wept and said, We can't. How can we? How can we sing a song when we're not in our native land? Imagine, God forbid, marriage is known for David. And we're taking to some camp somewhere and someone says, sing the yellow rose of Texas. Or sing the eyes of Texas are upon you. You say, we can't. We're not in our land. Or me, being in Oklahoma. Sing about Oklahoma. This is what the Babylonians have done. But the Jews couldn't open their mouth. The devil wants you to be in captivity far away. But that's like those Jews who sang in the Psalms, if we forget you, Lord Jesus, don't ever forget. No matter how far away we go, you have been sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a stamp. And though that prison is wiped off your brow and your eyes and your hands, God always sees you. There's nothing you can do to theory. But the more we walk in his commands, the brighter and the brighter will shine. But he's always ready for the moon. Maybe if we fall in a way, return, humbly, like the Father. If we know someone and we're given the opportunity to receive him, maybe not act like the Holy Brother, but like the good Father who is God himself. And welcome, welcome all. And we that and be that good God who desires not to let you, but life. Let's sing it to all of us.